just move this out of the way. So today's webinar is on V9 marketing with your customers. Now there's a couple of different tools that are built in for marketing purposes. Um, I know that you are a recent V8 to V9 upgrade. So some of the features that we have in V9 are exactly the same as they were in V8 as far as your functionality. There are a couple of new additional features that are new to version 9. I'm going to start with the ones that are similar first and then we'll look at some of the new ones. Okay. So one of the first features that um, a lot of people use for marketing purposes is what we call a POS flag. Now a POS flag, first off, it's set up in system preferences. And what it basically does is it, uh, I believe it's, yeah, right there. So what it basically does is it gives you an additional field on your receipt screen to track information about that transaction. Whether or not there's a customer or not is neither here nor there as far as the flags are concerned. But let's say that I set up POS flags to be demographics. Okay, and then my different options would be the 18 to 25 crowd, the 26 to 35 crowd, and so on and so on. So you can set this up to where it is a required field, meaning that the cashier has to make a mark or a choice every single transaction, or you can leave it to where it's on. they fill it in on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, obviously requiring it is going to give you the best results as far as reporting because every transaction will have a demographic choice. And that's um, just, but the demographic choice is the cashiers. That's correct. Okay. You know, now depending on the person that is standing in front of them, they may opt to ask them. You know, can I ask your age? Now that works if the person looks like they're under thirty, but if they look over forty and you're not wanting to take a chance, a lot of times it's their best guesstimate. Okay. So you know, it that is you know it does have some some error for or some room for for error there now if you some other samples of things that people have used the POS flag for is how did you hear about it you know so you know where to spend your advertising dollar now mm -hmm. that particular flag I do usually set it up to where it is required because I need to ask each and every customer unless I know that they're a repeat customer I need to ask each and every customer how they heard about us. Did they walk by and see us? Did a friend send them our way? Are they a repeat customer? So it also gives you the ability to track, you know, how, how many customers are coming in from your print ads, from your TV ads, your radio ads, any of your advertising. With that information, obviously, the next year when you're sitting down and going, okay, well, we have this much to spend in advertising this year, where do we need to spend it? By tracking that on each and every sale, you have a better idea of where that advertising dollar should be spent. Maybe you find that most of your customers are referral customers or repeat customers. Well, then instead of spending all the money on TV ads or radio ads, you might actually come up with some sort of referral program or referral incentive for your customers. Or, you know, Visit us 10 times, you'll get this for free type of thing, or half off. You know, maybe a loyalty program would be your best way of spending those advertising dollars to give those repeat customers that incentive to come in and, and shop more with you. Okay. Where um, does that information get stored? It gets stored at the receipt level, and it can, you already have three reports in your custom report area that will show you what kind of penetration you're getting on each of these flags. Okay. So there are there are three reports in the custom area that say, it literally will say POS flag one penetration, POS two flag penetration, and three penetration. So that okay. way you can kind of see. Okay, well this is these are the answers we're getting to these questions. Um, some people track the weather. You know, weather very people don't realize it, but it really does affect whether or not people are out shopping. Yes, it does. Um, you know, a, a little drizzly day doesn't keep the shoppers away, but a downpour will keep everybody inside. You know, so <laughs> that's something that, that we've seen people track. Um, you could track whether it was, you know, your most of your business was coming from men or women. 
Um, some of our some of our clients that are in more touristy type of situations, they track whether or not this customer is a tourist or a local. So, you know, if they're if most of your business or 55 or 60 percent of your business is coming from local customers, you might not need to advertise with the hotels as much as you advertise in a local magazine or newspaper. So, sure. those are available. Now, once you have okay. them set up in system, is that something that Go ahead. That's something that I set up myself. That's something that you can set up yourself, Correct. although we're more than happy to help you set it up if you want. Okay. So that, that was in options, system preferences, under local preferences, and then underneath point of sale, and it's underneath general. And you'll see right here there's a POS flag no field option. That's going to give you those three fields yep. that you can set up. Okay. And as you highlight the flag, yep. you'll notice down here, it gives you the potential for a list. OK. okay. So you just list okay. all the different options that you want to have available at the point of sale. And then it becomes, it becomes available once you update. Now, okay. there is a step two to that. It's important, especially if you're requiring one of those POS flags, it's important that you put that on the screen so the cashier has the ability to actually fill it in. So you'll notice down here at the bottom of my screen, I show the demographics that I just set up, and my choices are the ones that I also set up. Whereas flag two is not being used, so there are no choices. Okay. Okay. Now, if you require a flag, it will not let the cashier tender out, finish tendering out the receipt and print a receipt until that field is filled in. So just be aware that requiring it is a good thing in, a, in the sense that you're going to get an answer on every transaction, but it does have a downside that it is an extra keystroke at the point of sale, and it takes the cashiers you know, a, a few dozen times before they remember that it's going to stop them you know, before they can update this app. Right. So those need to be added onto the screen. Okay. And then, of course, like, like any other screen change in version 9, that needs to be copied over to all the other users on the point of sale station. Okay. Any, okay. any other questions about the POS flag? No. OK. Well, then let's go in and look. Again, I'm going to go into system preferences. And again, local preferences, only this time, I'm going to go into the customer area. Now, in the customer database, you have 20 fields that are available for you to set up and track anything that you want. Now, you might notice that I have a couple in here. I, I actually have a customer's data, data in my version 9, and they happen to be a, a bird shop. So bird type was important for them to track each customer, what type of bird do they have? If they get a really good deal on their large bird seeds, who better to market to than the people that own large birds? Right. So, excuse me, a lot of people track birth month. Um, you know, so you could send out uh, a little postcard or whatever saying, happy birthday, come and enjoy, you know, take 10% off for your birthday one time only. Now, 10% for the most part is usually going to cover the, the sales tax in most states. But even myself, and I know that it's fully system generated, I have a store here locally that every year I get, I get a little postcard for my birthday. I get it at the beginning of the month, even though my birthday is at the end of the month. I'm not at all offended. I know, I know mm -hmm. what's going on. But it does remind me, hey, I have not been into that store in a while. Why not go back when I have 10% off? Right. So, you know, birth month is a really, really popular one to, to, to track. And people are not usually hesitant to give you that information. Of course, you know, they don't want to give you the year they were born. And we don't really care what day they were born. We just want to be able to say, okay, show me all of my April birthdays and send out a mailer to all of those April birthdays. Mm -hmm. um, you could do this to track um, if they are collecting a certain thing. I have gift shops that, you know, they sell collectibles that are, you know, serial numbered the whole nine yards. They want to they keep track of what collections people are, are 
collecting. You know, so if sure. they have a new new one in the line coming in, those are the people I want to market to. You know, let right. them know, hey, there's a, a new one coming out in two months. Um, clothing stores a lot of times will track sizes or favorite vendors. You know, if you know that a particular vendor works for you, you look good in it, you feel good in it, I'm going to buy more of it. So, mm -hmm. again, it all comes down to who do you want to market to based on the situation. So, now, there are user-defined fields and auxiliary fields that the biggest difference between these two, first off, these first two are date fields. We don't recommend that you use them for, for birthdays because it always assumes their year of birth is this year, which it isn't, and then you don't want to ask, you know, what year were you born. Okay. Uh, but it does work well for anniversaries, you know. You can, people don't mind telling you that they've been married since 1960. So, right. um I also have some museums that track it for memberships or something along those lines. So if there's any kind of date that you want to keep track of, those fields are perfect for that. Now, the user-defined fields, you are limited to, I believe it's eight characters for the title. Oh, see, it's going to make a liar out of me. So it's ten characters. So if your title needed to be longer than ten characters, you would be better off with an auxiliary field. Um, it also gives you the the uh, options that you have here. I don't even know how many I have here. There we go. So down below, it won't let you type any more than I believe it's twenty. No, well, okay. So it's quite it's it's quite liberal. So you wouldn't have a problem with it. Okay. Okay. Now, the thing with the user-defined fields, the, the one big thing that I usually, it's going to determine whether I use a user-defined or I use an auxiliary, the user-defined are going to be in whatever order you type them in. That's going to be the way they see them, okay? Um, whereas the, use, the auxiliary fields down here, it will alphabetize the list that you create. So, like for a favorite vendor list, I always use an auxiliary field because my vendor list may be 40 or 50 vendors long. I want it to be easy for the cashiers to find the vendor in question by alphabetizing them. Um, okay. So that's, that's the biggest difference with the user to find versus the auxiliary fields. Now, those fields are customer related, so they are in the customer database. And I'm just going to go into form. And you'll see by default, these fields are already on here, and you can easily add to them or take them off to where you only show the ones that you're using. Okay. Okay, and then you just literally, you know, you come to the field. If As you're chit-chatting with the, with the customer, you may even bring it up in the conversation, you know, so what month were you born? And you, you choose the most appropriate month. Okay. Okay. Um, now, as far as the marketing of this, I usually do this in the list view, and I always set up a tab down along the bottom for the ones that I'm going to email versus the ones that I'm going to actually send through the mail. And so the ones that I'm going to send through the mail, I'm going to end up taking off everything but their first, last name, and their address information. On my email tab, I get rid of everything other than my first and last name and the email field. And the main reason that I do that is so if I come over here to filter view and well, once I add the, the uh, field on there that I want, okay, so I come down here and I say, okay, I want to see all of the April birthdays. I should only have the one, okay. But once I have this, I can right click and export it to Excel. Okay. Okay. Now, that's the reason that I make a separate tab is because if I right-click here and say select all, I'm going to get a lot of fields here that I don't need, which isn't necessarily a problem. I can still export it to Excel, but I just have to delete those extra fields. Okay. So it just really depends on how, whether or not you want to do the work in Retail Pro and setting up the, the tab that has just the, the contact fields you want or if you want to make your edits in Excel. That's really mm -hmm. what it comes down to. Okay? 
Okay. Um, once it's in Excel, obviously, you can do anything that you'd normally do with it. You know, you can highlight fields, you can rearrange fields, you can split information, all the normal things that you can do with Excel, is, as well as give it to a, a, a mailing company if that's what you're going to do with it. Okay? Okay. Yeah. So, um, now, a lot of people in version 8, it was really common to use the list reports to get that address information out or the email address information out. In version 9, we've actually found that it is easier and quicker just to do like I showed you, just right click and select all. You know, filter mm -hmm. it down to what you're looking for, but select all and then export it into a format that works for you. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Now, the last thing that I want to show you is under customer management, and it is, they are both new features to version 9, and that's the customer segments and the bins and scoring. Now I'm going to start with the bins and scoring because it's a little bit more in depth and a little more complicated to explain. Um, now, anytime you come in here, you're going to create a new bins and segment, and you'll notice that it does show you all the ones that you have ran before and what date range you ran them for and that type of thing. So, so I'm going to create a new one. You tell it what sales date range you want to go for. So what this is basically going to do is you're telling the computer, I want you to look at everyone that has shopped with us in, say, the last three years. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to see which customers are spending a lot, which customers are not spending a lot. Or maybe you want to see the people that are coming in the most often based on their visits. Um, it could be that you want to see the people that are doing a lot of returns. Um, so, But it all starts with the date range that you want to give the system. So I'm going to leave mine undefined only because I don't make daily sales like you guys do. And mm -hmm. I'm, Mine is more of a hit or miss. I may do two sales in one week and not do it for another two months. So I'm going to leave it undefined so I can get the full view of it. You can edit this down. So if you wanted to edit it down, you just create your filter and grab all the fields that you want. Now, I do want to point out on this filter, all of these are customer-related fields. So if I wanted to... You know, you'll notice all of these, I could put birth month in there, I could put last name, first name, any of that information, but down towards the bottom, I can also add receipt item fields. So my description one, or description two, or my DCS. So you can filter by both customer-related fields and sales-related fields, which this is one of the only places that you can do that. Okay. Okay. So just make sure that you grab where it says receipt item. Other, if it doesn't say receipt item, it is customer related. Okay? okay. So you can filter this down by whatever you want and then click OK and obviously then your filter would be in place. Now it is going to require that you give it a name. So I'm just going to call this training. Okay. Now the bin type, you can do either equal customer count, meaning you have 15,000 customers in your database. If I tell it right here the number of bins and I have it set for 10, then it is going to put equal groupings of customers in each bin. So, you know, 15,000 customers, I get 1,500 customers in each of my 10 bins. Okay. You can do, and which honestly for me, I've never really found that that helps me because you know, one customer may spend $100 in my time frame and somebody else is spending $5,000. i am going to market to those two customers vastly different. Obviously, one is coming in on a regular basis, or when they do come in, they spend a, a nice amount of money versus the customer that pops in every now and then and doesn't buy a lot of stuff. That's, mm -hmm. I'm going to market to them differently. So I don't find that the customer count helps me as much, but it is an availability. Okay. What I usually use is the equal metric value. And then you have the choice of what metric value you want to base it on. So it can be based on number of transactions, number of visits, what their average 
transaction sale dollar is. So on an average, they've been in 10 times this year. On an average, they spend $128, okay? So you can base it on that. You can base it on average quantity per transaction. What I almost always use, especially when I'm training people on it though, is the total sales. Because we all know who the best customers are. We don't usually keep track of who our worst customers are though. So, but this is going to, most people consider their best customer the one that buy, spends the most money. That's who we almost all think of as the best customer. And that would be total sales dollar. Now you can change the number of bins here. It can be any number that you choose. I'm gonna go a little lower because I know I don't have that, that many customers in my database. And I can even come down here to my bin description and put in a little comment about what this was all about. You know, why am I running this bin? What's the purpose of it? Or what am I hoping to gain out of it? And you will notice that that description will show up right here on this list of bins. Okay. So, you know, a year from now, you can go back and go, hey, that was a pretty good marketing campaign. Let's try that again. What did I do? You can reopen it up and reuse it or copy those, those settings for the new, for the new run. So I'm just going to click on Generate. It's going to go through and look at all the customer's information. Now, with this one highlighted, I want to see those bins that it created. It's all done, but I need to see the bins. So I'm going to click over here on the side where it says Show Bins. And so you'll see I have five bins. Most of my customers end up in bin one. Out of the 2,500 customers or whatever that I have, 2381 of them fell into bin one where they spent between zero and eight hundred and sixty four dollars then my second bin has 12 customers that spent eight hundred sixty four to the seventeen twenty nine the difference between these two numbers is the same for every bin it's an eight hundred and sixty four dollar difference between eight sixty four and seventeen twenty nine okay it's a 864 difference between 729 and 2594 and so forth. Okay? Now, those 2381 customers, I can show those customers if I choose to. I'm going to show you with, with a smaller group because it's a little easier to see. So now I show those customers and I see their names, their email, their address, everything that I need to contact them. But I can also look, and it's just a different page down here, I can see their last sale date, how many visits they've had, how many sales transactions they've had. Like this customer down here, or right here, they've been in 17 times, they've bought 24 items and never returned a single one of them. Hmm. Okay, I see the total sales dollar, what profit I've made, how many units they've bought, um, and I don't have any year-to-date sales or returns yet from this customer. Okay, but this is showing you those customers. Now, mm -hmm. you can do the same thing here like we did in the customer database, and you can right click and select all, and then send these to Excel to do whatever you wanna do with them. Okay, or you can send this to Excel. Now, if you are going to be sending out a mailer, you may want to use the ability to print your labels right from here. So if I click on print labels, I'm gonna use just a standard three across address label. It does not have to be Avery, it does not have to be an 8160 model number, as long as it's a three across address label. They're all the same size, same number of, of labels on each sheet, no matter who makes them. So I'm gonna choose that three across, click okay, and tell it, show me all the listed records. Now I usually preview it because you may have noticed that a lot of addresses are missing in here. So right. I'm gonna see how many are missing and if it's worth it to me to send them an email versus sending them a, a postcard. And so what I'm gonna get from looking at the preview is that I only have four good addresses in here. Mm -hmm. So I may decide to send an email instead because it looks like I have emails for everyone in this list. Email would be a better way of contacting these customers. Okay. okay, so that's, that's bins and scoring. Basically, your 
grouping customers together by something they share in common, you can do as few bins as you want or as many bins as you want. The more bins you do, the more it's going to spread out the difference between the two. Okay. okay. Any questions about that? I know it's a lot to take in all at once. Yeah, not yet, no. Okay. Well, I do recommend get in here and play around with it because it's not going to affect anything else in the system. It's not going to change the customer database in any way, shape, or form. It really is just a tool intended for you to try to group customers together by whatever means you, you feel is necessary. Okay, great. That's what I'll okay. do. Okay. <laughs> now, I actually find that I use the, the customer segments probably a little bit more than the binning. Um, primarily for customers that have bought a certain vendor. That's always, that always seems to be the one that I'm going for, usually because maybe I'm doing a trunk show with these three vendors and I want to reach out to the people that have bought from those vendors before. Or you know, maybe I'm doing a trunk show on a certain, certain department and I want those people to come out as well. So segments are a lot more simplified than the bins are. You start off the same way. You give it the date range of sales that you want it to look at. You always have to say, you know, between this time and this time, you know, who bought merchandise from us. But you use your, your filter a lot more heavily than you do in the, in the bins. So I'm just going to scroll down because I know all my receipt items are down near the bottom. And I want vendor code. That's the one that I really want. Okay. You, like I said, you could choose you know, description or department or whatever else you wanted. Okay. And then you choose the vendor that you want to see. And I'm just going to, I know it's, I believe that's my vendor. And I click OK. I can give the filter a name. It could be that vendor name. It could be anything I want to call it. Okay, I give the segment a name, so again, I'm just going to call training, but a lot of times what I see other customers doing is whatever they're filtering by and today's date is usually what they name the segment. So if okay. you were filtering for a certain department, I might call it, you know, the sweaters, you know, 040417 or, you know, vendor XYZ 4417, something along those lines. Right. Okay. You do, again, have a description if you want to be a little more wordy with it and a little more detailed with, with what you're trying to gather here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and generate it. And again, I want to show my customers. So these are all of the customers that have bought from that vendor since I dropped this data in here. So. Again, I'm seeing a lot of missing addresses, so sending a postcard is not going to be my best bet. An email blast looks like it's going to be my best bet. And this particular customer, they do require first name, last name, and email address. So that's how they market is through the, the email address. So, but same type of thing, you just simply right click, select all, and then send it wherever you want to send it. Okay. okay, that can be to the printer, it can be to any format that you see listed here. Okay. Okay, so segments and bins, they're very similar. Bins digs a little deeper than segments does, but sometimes it digs maybe a little too deep for what you're looking for. And if that's <laughs> the case, then I would recommend that you try segments and see if that doesn't fit you a little bit better. All right. Okay. So those are all of the tools that we have within Retail Pro for marketing in version 9. Can I, any questions about anything that I've covered? No, not yet. Okay. Any questions that I can answer for you about anything version 9 related? Because I, I don't have anything more to show you. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I wasn't here for version 8, so. Okay, well that's. In, that's kind Which of a good very thing. interesting. You don't, any, you don't have any bad hab you don't have any habits that we have to break, so that's kind of a good thing. <laughs> that's true. So 
Well, um, like I said, this webinar will be recorded and it will be up on YouTube within a couple of days. I, I happen to be the one that posts everything up to YouTube, so I know how long it generally takes me. Um, but it will be up there for you to view as many times as you want, to review it, anything like that. Um, if you forget the path on how to set up flags or anything like that, like I said, that video will be up there for you to use as much as you need to. And where do I go to get that? Just to YouTube? Um, just go to YouTube, and or if you, you go to YouTube and then you search for Big Hairy Dog, it'll take you right to our channel. Okay, In fact, great. It, it, that would probably not be a bad place for you to go. We also have training videos up there on version 9 and version 8, but there's a lot of good you know, webinars that have already been recorded. They're up there. So it's, it's a good place to kind of go and, and poke around and see if you find anything that interests you. Uh, there, there's other marketing out there? There's not other marketing for version 9, but there are other topics for version 9 up there. Okay, great. Okay, you just want to look for the ones that are labeled V9. Those are the ones that you want to focus on. V9, okay. Okay. All right, wonderful. Okay, well, I want to thank you so much for joining me today, and feel free to join us on any other webinar that you see coming down the line. We have our full year schedule up on our website. You're welcome to sign up for as many of our webinars as you like. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you. You have a great day. Have, thanks. You too. Bye.